Abe here, and I wanted to let you know that if you're able, you can upgrade your small beans skill over at patreon.com slash small beans. Here's why you should do that. If you pledge five measly beans a month, you get access to about half our podcasts that you don't get if you're just listening to the free feed. Shows include Star Trek The Next Futurama, Spielboys, Like Razor Blade Pie, and bonus episodes of I'll Show You Mine If You Show Me Yours. Not to mention bonus content, including info and updates on the movie we're making, Papa bear. Hey, where's all the reasons to not subscribe to Patreon? I can't find them. Anyway, back to the show. Coming back, and then like a whole thing, like a lot of guitar for a long time. Imagine a big pile of notes of guitar. Now you listen to me, Mr. Grand High Pooh Bob <laughs> up a butt crack. I'm just about half past. Give a shoot with your fun and games. Maybe the best line in the movie. Uh, I mean, might, there might not be a maybe about that. Yeah, there might. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm, I, I liked it though. Yeah, I liked thanks, bro. What you did. I didn't pre-write a song this time, so that was semi-improv and not as good as some of them. Still better than I could do, man. But that's all right. Uh, we are the Kings of King, your friendly neighborhood cockers. Uh, I'm Michael Swain. That's Abe Epperson. Hi. And uh, we talk about all things adapted from the works of one Stephen King, and uh, try to connect dots to the tropes that he. And I mention this because I think it's going to come into play today. Case in point, maybe the pinnacle of Stephen King's love of quaint old fashioned nor'easter phrases that you've, you're not aware of. Ooh boy. Like half past give a shit. Oh, that's fun. I didn't know people Mr. said that. Mr. <laughs> Grand High Poobah. Mr. Great of, of, of. Upper butt crack. <laughs> that is... I am impressed <laughs> and absolutely, I find it an atrocity. Yeah, it's hard I to tell it, even if it's an insult or a compliment. <laughs> I, 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 I find it just eye-opening. It's it's everything. I am inspired. I am angry. Here mm-hmm. we go. Here we go. And we usually kick things off with a quick synopsis. So if you're not familiar with Dolores Claiborne, as neither of us were, first time. That's right. Long time listener, first time reviewer. Um, So let's dive in and like say what Dolores Claiborne is about by looking under the dome. Our best guess puts the dome at 20,000 feet, sir. Did he just call it a dome? You think we might be stuck in here a while? All right, we're under there. We're under there, under that dome. It's, it's night. Imagine if you will, it's 1995 and we're talking about Dolores Claiborne. Abe, you want to start the synopsis off? The film starts with Dolores who's like a domestic servant uh, slash nurse Mm -hmm. uh, having a struggle with her elderly, uh, partially paralyzed employer, Vera Donovan. Vera falls down the stairs and as she's about, as Dolores is about to kill her with a rolling pin, a mailman walks in (laughs) and witnesses the event and goes, oh, but if you're and I'm, oh boy. And who's flying the house? Yeah. And um, he he walks up to Vera, uh, you know, D- Dolores steps back and is in, you know, shambles like she just got found ki- apparently killing right. Vera. And Vera's and, last uh, words Vera's are, uh, Dolores, please. And then she dies. It's like, and she dies. Pretty it's incriminating. not looking good. Not looking not good looking for good D. so far for Dolores in the first two minutes. And we cut to Selena, who is Dolores' da- daughter. Oh, by the way, Dolores is paid, like if you haven't seen this, played by uh, Kathy Bates. Selena is uh, played by uh, Jennifer Jason Lee. Ooh, top shelf. Uh, and uh, Selena is a journalist in New York City. And she has to go to Maine uh, to essentially deal with this because she finds out her mom is now 
you know, basically uh, a murderer, possibly. Mm -hmm. Um, And when she arrives, she insists, I didn't kill Vera. And they're pretty estranged. So, like, Dolores doesn't even recognize Selena at first. It's been 15 years. And uh, she, we get the feeling that Selena doesn't really believe her mother when she says she didn't commit the murder. Um, more on that later. We meet Christopher, Christopher Plummer, who's a detective. We meet John C. Riley, a constable. This is a stacked cast, my boy. My God. Um, what else we got? Dolores basically is an outcast of the town. The town sees her as a murderer already after the death of Joe, uh, who is her husband, played by Strathairn. Stack cast. Yeah, Husband. he got drunk and fell down a well, but people, the the scuttlebutt is she killed him. That's the scuttlebutt. And now the new she, scuttlebutt as well. There she goes and, again. <laughs> and this, uh, this, and in very King fashion, people vandalize her house. They taunt her in the street. They do drive-by screamings. So uh, many King bullies yelling insults that you've never heard from like, the hey, 50s. you're a murderer, old uh, lady. <clears throat> even the, um... Well, we'll talk about it, but the graffiti on her house, I feel like Stephen King wrote because like he loves the he loves some very basic phrases like eat shit is a standard mm-hmm. Stephen King yeah. like work a day insult. And then, of course, something like grand poop of upper butt crack is when he's feeling <laughs> spicy. He's feeling, he's feeling himself, <laughs> yeah, you know, himself, he's, yeah. he just took a shower. He's feeling clean. Um, yeah. So Plummer, I, yeah. or if I may, uh, just for yeah, a little yeah, bit, please. I'll take that because I'm on my spray paint note. Plummer is constantly hassling the most of all. Uh, his deputy, played by John C. Riley, did we mention stacked cast, um, is really coming at her, has a hard on to close the case and reveals that like he has 80 some cases and this is the one case he never closed. So I always think it's fun. for him. This is a totally different movie. It's like a action mm-hmm. thriller. Cops got to do his last case before he retires movie. But we're having a mother daughter time over there. And mm-hmm. uh, we see that they have concerns for each other and things is sort of interest them, shall we say, given the time apart. Um, Kathy Bates is interested to find out that Jennifer Jason Lee is a drunk and chain smoker and pill popper and mixes those things and takes uh, and drinks the kind of whiskey that her dad drank, who was a drunk, abusive guy. So Ooh. it's all highly symbolic. And she notices that uh, Kathy Bates lived full time in Vera's house. And so their their childhood home is like no gas, no power, vandalized holes in the windows like she's living like a terrible life. And worked herself to death for this horrible Vera woman who's a notorious cunt for like 80 bucks a week or something they finally reveal. Um, it's 40 bucks a week. It's yeah, like 40 bucks a week. 20 yeah. cents an hour or Even, something. And this is, you know, 1979 or whatever. Even with inflation, that ain't much. Um, and this finally all comes to a head with the daughter trying to make excuses about how she has other big newspaper stories she's got to do. So I don't know, maybe I got to leave. I don't know how long I'll stay. I'm here to help you get a lawyer. I do care. You are my mom, but like, stay the fuck away from me also. And the thing that finally comes to light and brings it to a head is she goes, Oh yeah. Oh, you didn't kill her. Just like you didn't kill dad. Right. And leaves the room and you, the audience are like, Oh really? Oh, so the daughter also thinks that she killed the dad. And then we start getting, they were seated earlier, but around this time we start getting flashbacks because they're in their childhood home. Right. And for both of them, this starts to happen. Uh, and I think we'll talk about it from a craft perspective, but right now, just from a story perspective, they see things at home that remind them of things. Right. So as we're getting the present day narrative, we're getting the past narrative. You're used to it. It's like an episode of lost and the past narrative is the dad. And I think they do an interesting thing where you're constantly wondering, is this when she kills him? Is this when she kills him? Right, Cause yeah. you know, and you get a little bit of how that all went down. <clears throat> you I'm going to take a sip of my Bates. coffee. So Abe, you want to dive oh, yeah, in? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> Dolores pleads with Selena that she did like, I did all of this work to make sure you got off the Island. And you need to understand that all I care about is what you think of me, as opposed to I don't give a shit what other people. Or if I go to jail, I don't care. Yeah. And Christopher Plummer arrives in the present day to stop by to take a DNA sample. And he fires some not so cryptic signals that he thinks uh, she did the murder. And he thinks that she also killed Joe 18 years ago. And uh, there's a wonderful line that I wrote down that Dolores says is I'm not because she's like, Selena's like, you shouldn't be making enemies. And Dolores, just true to form, 
I'm not making an enemy. I'm keeping one, <laughs> which I just thought that's like a perfect. And Doris doesn't give starts a fuck. to reveal the split because there's a bit of a Rashomon because mm. Selena's like, I thought dad seemed pretty cool. Like he drank and but he was friendly. I don't ever remember him hitting you or what you're talking about. And you're like, right. oh, who's right, right? It's beyond the who done it. It's also whose version of history is right. Because Dolores treats it like he beat the shit out of me constantly and I had to shield you from all that. And then when she sees Christopher Plummer, she's like, you don't even remember him? He fucking traumatized you by interrogating you when dad died, when you were a kid. And she's like, yeah, I she's don't remember like, any of this shit, mom. All I remember, I remember is that you, you said this. Yeah. And yeah, you were like straight up a B. Uh, and, and I love my dad. And, you're a hard and I love bitch all the time. Yeah. I, I, I love David Strait there. And I love. He uh, was fun. Uh, I love Christopher <laughs> Plummer. They're, they're awesome. Um, so clearly there's some trauma, some hidden kind of uh, memory going on. Somebody's wrong. Somebody's somebody you know, stop David it. Strather. <laughs> Somebody stop him. Uh, and so we see that strained relationship. Uh, she Christopher Plum, uh, Plummer comes to uh, Jennifer Jason Lee, doesn't mince words, and he's like, "She's gonna kill again, and that blood's gonna be on your hands." Uh, we get another flashback, uh, basically of uh, after the death of Joe, where Selena has a nervous breakdown. And she smashes a Christmas ornament and cuts her neck with it. And this is like kind of mixed in the present day with her current timeline woes of not getting the big scoop you mentioned and having to come home, which she doesn't want to do. And she tries to storm out of the house. And I wanted to point this out later just for execution. But her car gets stuck and she's forced to stay the night. And loses her newspaper job over a fight. She like says, fuck you to the guy I quit on an impulse. Yeah. And she tries to drive away drunk and is so drunk that she fucks up. She's in a ditch. So now she's got to stick it out. She's got to stick what it out. What were you going to point out is, about it? About that well, fact? in execution, just like the way the uh, things that uh, King does, you know? Oh, just a yeah. This is the nexus King-ism. of all Kingisms. But without yeah. being a horror movie, that's supernatural, which is really fascinating. Right. Um, yeah, so that's, it's basically the escalation of that and the divergence between their two stories, pushing each other away. And we see a lot of iterations of not being willing to admit from both sides the reality of a situation or hold the past truthfully in your head or tell yourself the tough story. Like we see that Kathy Bates says, you didn't have a nervous breakdown. It was just a bad patch. You're not crazy. You're not right. crazy at all. And you're like, okay, so this family can't like come to terms with shit. Right. Right. And we see in more of Dolores's flashbacks and I don't know if there's anyone who watches it vaguely. I think the film strongly implies that they're true. Like you're not like wondering is her mind lying? They'd don't seem to play with that or they until the very end, which I guess if you were you thinking know. she murdered the Vera, you could think this is fake, too. But I mean, I assumed it was true. But anyway, in her right. version of events, David Strathern was in AA, but constantly drinking secretly, like pouring mm. whiskey in his Coke and shit. Um, when his daughter was in the room, he would be on his best behavior. But when he would get drunk, he wouldn't want his daughter to see him. And when she left the room, he'd call his wife, you know, verbally abusive, call her fat and ugly and say, I don't know why I married you. I hate you and all this horrible stuff. And then if she ever talked back, he would beat her, hit her with various objects. He hits her with a log at one point and like the kidneys and, you know, classic abusive relationship. He goes like, why do you make me do it? Uh, sometimes he's nice, but most of the time, unpredictably, he'll just snap and beat the sh beat you. And you don't know, yeah, like exactly. sometimes he'll laugh and then beat you or joke and then beat you. It's really scary. Um, but it's double scary because he won't do it in front of the daughter scrupulously. And it's like, oh man, that is a fucking head trip. You it know, it's a horror movie. Yeah. 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 Certainly, I just meant there's no killer clown uh, other than John C. Riley. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, this escalates to the point that we find out that he was murdered on the eclipse. There's another eclipse coming up. Or I think it happened when she tried to drive her car away. Right. That was the current day eclipse. But in the past, there was also this, the same eclipse or similar event. And we start filling in the past with Vera Moore, which we hadn't before, because basically mm -hmm. Kathy Bates says, no, sit down. Your car's busted. We're having a drink and we're talking this out. Right. This has to end. So she tells her what she says is the whole truth. 
Um, Selena still doesn't buy it, by the way, fully until this next, like the end beats. But basically her story is Vera was this horrible wench with OCD who ran this giant mansion and she was like interviewing, you know, auditioning for a housekeeper. And she's insanely particular because I mean, I got the impression she literally has OCD because she'd be like, mm-hmm. you know, the welcome mat has to face northeast. And it the, needs to be six pins, not five for the when you hang the cold sheets, you have to hang the sheets more than 50 yards from the house or I can smell it. So it's like she has to walk back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, everyone quits, but her. And she constantly not only bitches about her, but they joke about how they're going to murder each other. Right. So for like 20 years, she says stuff to everyone like, I hate you, bitch. I'm going to throw you out the window one of these days. That's their relationship. And you get it like there are they are two bitches. And it's a recurring line in the movie that she learned from Vera. Sometimes in a world that's like stacked against women, all a woman has to hold on to is being a bitch. Um, So you get the sense that the truth of it is. She didn't need to do that. She like admires this woman in some perverse way that I've seen relationships like, right? Where people just get off on busting each other's balls constantly. That is the nature of their friendship. But they are actually friends in some way. Um, And she goes, so I didn't kill her. She wanted to die when she was really old. And she pushed herself down the stairs. I tried to stop her. She bit my arm. You'd think she could show the bite to the cops, but whatever. She bit my arm and pushed herself down the stairs. And wanted to die. And the reason I got the rolling pin was she was badly internally bleeding. And she begged me and begged me to just end it. Please crush my head with something and end it. And I was about to do that when the fucking mailman came in. Yep, and that was not mailman. ideal. Yeah. So it's this finally the makes fucking mailman. Selena like kind of believe it uh, and want to stick up for her mom and realize that she's throwing her chances away because she's waived counsel. She's old and tired. Which is funny because Kathy Bates is not that old in this, like 45 or something. Um, She's 14 years older than Je- uh, Jennifer Jason Lee. Yeah. Wow. Which is oh, bizarre. Like, I mean, yeah. Just because I mean, she has like a know. square face or, or like, a, you know, they're like, man, she's old. But anyway. They did. Yeah. They did a lot of makeup on. Yeah. They give her gray hair version. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the point being. Selena, who she's always been proud of because she is so bright and tenacious, uses her skills and brights and tenaciousness to take her into town or like storm in in the middle of her hearing. There's not going to be a jury trial yet. It's just a hearing uh, with like a judge arbitrator to rip them a new one and tear apart Christopher Plummer's case and point out that it's all circumstantial. And why the fuck would she murder this woman? Oh, sorry. Something we forgot to reveal that is important is the biggest piece of evidence against her is they find out that Vera left her all her money. And she goes, that's just because she like felt sorry for me. And I didn't know about it. And they're like, of course, you knew about it. You murdered her for the money. And Selena in this sequence rightly points out why the fuck would she wait like eight years since the will was inked to publicly push her down the stairs at the time she knows the postman regularly comes by. This is bullshit. And they're like, ah, you got me. Or, you know, the judge basically sides with her. And Christopher Plummer realizes that there's things more important than his fucking case, right? Uh, And then I think that's when we get the major reveal, right? This is when we get the full reveal is when Selena's driving home and here's the tape. Isn't that right? Yeah, I mean, it is it is very blended, so we're not really sticking to the, you know, how it yeah, actually operates. Yeah, I don't care if the past, present shuffling is accurate, right? But yeah, ultimately, uh, it's all about this bottled up trauma that we find out that Dolores at one point tells Vera, look, this is what I think is happening, which is basically two parts. It starts with all the money that she's been saving from Vera, Dolores goes to the bank. And she figures out, oh, uh, J- uh, oh, David Strathairn is taking Joe, out yeah. all of the money. Uh, and you wouldn't be doing this. You wouldn't have, and you didn't call me or anything. So he's doing this, so he's doing this bullshit. So he, she starts looking into his life and seeing like, where's he spending the money? And she starts realizing that like, not only is he just like blowing it on booze, booze which that there's something AA, going right? on between uh, between Selena, uh, the daughter and, uh, and David Strathairn. Mm-hmm. And we realize that through a kind of moment where they kind of, in the flashback where she, she takes her on a ferry 
which comes up a lot of times. The ferry is like where the truth comes out. Right. Um, it's a liminal space. It's a liminal space. Two things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, it's kind of like an eclipse, man. <laughs> and it's like uh, what you get is you you essentially re, uh, Dolores oh, realizes that around her neck. That's actually a good connection that I didn't yeah. get. Uh, when she she realizes that she has an amulet. Selena has an amulet around her neck. That is the like the grandmother of uh, David Strathairn. So why is he giving this to her? She starts thinking something's going on. On top of that, when she's questioning her daughter, like what is wrong? Like Selena is in hysterics. That's Selena's, a dead giveaway. Cause she immediately it's a dead goes, giveaway. yeah, no, like, daddy never touched me. No, it's a secret. I mean, it's not a secret. It never happened. Like shit like so that. You're like, she oh, puts shit. this all together. Yeah. It's unverified. She doesn't know how long it's going on, but she's absolutely sure. Another liminal space, the space between knowing and not knowing that is like a trial or a, yeah, interesting. And so one particular day where she basically breaks down at work, she tells Vera about Joe, the money and the sexual abuse. And, you know, in the current day, (laughs) Selena is still denying this all. Yeah. Um, And we still think that, and she still thinks that Dolores is a horrible mother and wife. So. Selena just heads out of town, but she finds this tape recorded by Lourdes, which basically says in the flashback, Vera asks, how far did the sexual abuse go? And uh, she points out that it's a masculine world we live in. And sometimes uh, you need to kill your husband (laughs) because we learn that Vera, who had a husband it was just like days. a shitty golf playing f- rich guy. Also had a, a mistress. Shit. Yeah. And, oh, and she made a car right. accident it looked like an accident. Specifically but to get us know, all his money. She probably just cut the cut the brakes. And they're multimillionaires. So I love the idea that she's like, uh, well, just kill him, dear. It worked for me. I have millions of dollars. I didn't go <laughs> yeah, to <exactly>. jail. <laughs> you should do that. And she's like, says, kill him. Basically in code, you know, subtext. Um, I'm going to keep your daughter here for the eclipse party. Now is the time to go murder, go murder your husband now. Right. And I'll be your alibi and come back in a couple hours and have him be dead. And I'm giving you permission to do that. Yeah. And still in this long kind of flashback sequence, we get Selena with the fallout of like the, you know, basically the confrontation on the ferry. She decides to run away from home basically. And Dolores pursues. And as she's running, she finds a small abandoned well, like a boarded up well that, you know, she didn't know Just existed. Just like Cujo in her yard. did. Yeah. And she hurts her leg and whatnot, but she we now have an exposed well. And we do know from earlier the well it comes into play with Stray there. And so um that day of the eclipse, Vera sends Dolores home, hoping that, you know, you go kill your husband. Dear. And Dolores yeah. gets him drunk with some fine booze. <laughs> Treat yourself, bitch. <laughs> is overly kind to him, makes him dinner. And as the eclipse sets, she confronts him about the stolen money and to go fuck himself. And he attacks her. And the struggle goes on towards the yard. And then she goes, she- you're touching our daughter, aren't you? And now yes. he's going to murder her to keep her from telling. Like she's right. So she's guaranteed he will chase her. That obviously is the goal. Right. And she draws him to the old well. She lets him fall to his death. And as the eclipse is forming, she's like, I could save him. No, I'm just going to let him fall. It's a liminal and space, dude. It's, it's a liminal space. But also that the, the well. I'm actually realizing with a rush of joy that there's more to this than I think there was symbolically. Like the tape recorder is also specifically the tape recorder that uh, Selena uses for her reporting job. So it right. is also a vessel for the truth. And it's like a movie about the tiny little corners where you're allowed to tell the horrible truth, yeah, right? Man. Yeah, man. Dolores Claiborne. Claiborne, man. man. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. As we pop to the present day and we get that kind of, I think it's a, a really well done moment. Like the, she buys a coffee cup and it triggers her memory of the time that her father forced Made her to her, touch him. Do a hand job on the ferry. And yeah. we get a clear indication. This is not the first time. And uh, we get a haunting little shot. You said it wasn't a horror movie and it isn't. It's a drama. But we get a sh- haunting little shot of the present where once Selena is kind of realized, she goes to the bathroom to kind of collect herself. She looks in the mirror and her reflection was looking 
away from her. You, she sees the back. back of her head, which is really and that freaks her it's out. It's even scarier than it sounds because it's in a movie where nothing like that has happened, and it's yeah. really creepy. Yeah, and the sound effect, the sound, the score is going on. It's it's a pretty kind of manufactured well moment like i was it, not expecting and it's earned i look in the mirror and i don't even recognize myself right yeah yeah i think it's justifiable and she's like having a panic attack and looking she's back a, at the past yeah so she realizes she must return to the island and she arrives at dolores's inquiry i'm get sorry that back i flopped um, between the flip, tape is between. why she comes back you're right it's the yeah, inspiration yeah, yeah. Of the and tape. so we get all that stuff where plumber basically is like you haven't been home you don't know this shit and dolores basically testifies that she didn't know about the will and the final nail in the coffin is she points out that plumber's got that personal vendetta against dolores so you know yeah uh in the end with the looming threat of like okay so she's gonna dolores is gonna get all this like 1.6 million dollars from various who knows what know, will happen out, out of that yeah. right and the threat of New York City lawyers, because, you know, Selena's connected. This small town is not equipped to really fight this battle. And there's not, and it's all circumstantial evidence anyway. So they just let the case drop, basically. And uh, our last scene is Dolores and Selena reconciling on the ferry uh, before Selena returns to New York. And she even admits, like, I'm not going to Arizona. I'm not, I didn't get that job. They're now turning a leaf and telling each other the truth, so to speak. She's like, I'm going back to my life. But I'll be in touch. Yeah. So there's this vindication. Uh, blowing kisses, you know. Now, very different than when they arrived. When they, when she arrived on the ferry, she didn't know that that was her daughter. Now they're blowing kisses goodbye. That's the arc. <laughs> so, yeah. I think that we can jump right into our next one, right? I believe yeah? so. Our next. Yeah. Yeah, because I want to get into the nitty gritty as fast as we can. But gritty, gritty, nitty. First. First, we need to discuss uh, who worked on this movie, just because mm -hmm. let's let's put it in perspective about, you know, the crew that's working on this. Yeah. Uh, and so we have to go to the next section called Skeleton Crew. Something in the mist! Shut the doors! Shut the doors! Them bones, them bones, them movie bones. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned it came mm -hmm. out in 1995. Several I just wanted times. to mention... That it came, it was it came out the same month as the Mangler. Ooh, another great film featuring uh, uh, Buffalo Bill from another great film. <laughs> All you horror. Got it, you got it. We got a horror circle going. Um, yeah, but of course we mentioned the stacked cast. Uh, John C. Riley, not a big name at this time, so it's one of his like building his career roles. Uh, you, he's not like heavily centered. But David Strathairn, and Christopher Plummer, Eric. Bogosian, who you know his face for sure, is the mm -hmm. newspaper boss. Jennifer Jason Lee, of course, and Kathy Bates holding it down. Uh, Bob Gunton is another character actor where you'd see him and go, oh, yeah, his face. He's the bank manager guy. Uh, kind of yeah. looks like Ben Stein. Uh, he's in some Coen Brothers movies. I think Serious mm -hmm. Man. Mm -hmm. He's also in Shawshank Redemption as the warden. Oh, yeah, the warden from Shawshank. Of course, that's the big one. Um, directed by Taylor Hackford, who, and then written by Tony Gilroy. Abe, can you do your spiel you gave me? Because I was ignorant of, oh, it's that Gilroy. And then the whole brother thing. Yeah, sure. Let's start with Hackford first, though. Of because, course. Hey, I, I actually, uh, spoilers, I really like, really like this movie. I think it's meticulously crafted. And it makes sense because the guy who created it, or the guy who directed it, uh, is known for an officer and a gentleman. Mm -hmm. and Ray, which got a bunch of awards and whatnot, but both kind of um, very good, very good like dramas that like kind of inspect the internal conflict of someone. Um, so he's, you know, he's pretty, he's, he's not bad. He's not, he's not a bad director, but yeah, let's talk about the Gilroy. <laughs> Uh, Tony yeah. Gilroy, not to be confused with his brother, Dan Gilroy, who wrote uh, Nightcrawler, you know, baby. Nightcrawler, big fan. Among we, other we, things, but God, what a screenplay for Nightcrawler. We love yeah. Nightcrawler in this house. <laughs> um, and they both work together on Andor, which is a current Star Wars uh, series, if you're in the know with the Star Wars kids. Tony I Gilroy also them. wrote Rogue One, which is one of the Star Wars that is good. Mm -hmm. uh, and those Michael are few Clayton. now. Michael Clayton. All of the Bourne ultimatums. That means he uh, co-wrote with Tom Stoppard at some point, y'all. Damn. That's crazy dude. to me. Um, but yeah, the first two movies that he came out with, uh, that he wrote, were The Cutting Edge in 92. <laughs> have you seen The Cutting yeah. Edge mm -hmm. from our frame rate? That's right. And Dolores Claiborne. And I have to say wow. that I think the, the writing in this edge. movie is spectacular. I think it's really, really good. 
And I think it's above and beyond what we typically see in an adaptation of, um, of Stephen King, brought to you by the guy who wrote the adaptation of Armageddon, by the way. <laughs> the novelization, you mean? No, he, he wrote the adaptation. Oh, is Armageddon a, a book? What was Armageddon before it was I a, think, who was knows? It a comic? <laughs> who knows with it? What was Armageddon? I didn't know it was anything. It, it was probably a novel, like an action novel. I'd buy it. It was like a Crichton-esque novel. Before it was probably it was, okay. based off Armageddon the Some album. Some bullshit. Yeah, all, yeah, 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 it's Halen fucking album. Michael Bay, dude. But it had it like a bunch of writers a tool on music it. video. Anyway, we also, <laughs> yeah. um, I feel like we're kind of leaving Skeleton Crew because you're talking about I want to mention qualities, one more thing. But I wanted to mention Danny Elfman. Danny Okay, good. Elfman. My favorite um, film composer, mainly because I'm a huge fan of the Mystic Knights of Oingo Boingo, which is their full name. It was the first con the first concert I ever attended was their final farewell concert, as I've mentioned before on this network. And I still think Oingo Boingo are incredible. Regular rotation for me. Um, and this is a very Danny Elfman proving that he can be more subdued than Simpsons and it's even Batman. Days, yeah. It's him trying to be a quote unquote real score composer. Um, it's very symphonic and drab and sad. And the movie's very blue. Honestly, I think Abe will back me up on this. If you haven't seen it at all and you want to know vibe, it's very much like insomnia vibe. <laughs> if you've seen yeah, that. I would say that. Yeah. It's like a Christopher Nolan joint. Almost. Yeah, yeah. For real. Yeah. But yeah, very good cast and crew. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, and the proof is in the pudding, baby. Let's talk about the movie uh, in our next segment that we call it. Bill, if you'll come with me, you'll float too. You'll float too. You'll float too. Speaking of killer clowns. Uh, yeah, it. I actually, I have a lot and I'm realizing I have more as we talk, but like I wanted to. Let's go. Yeah, I'll just throw in the first thing in my notes, which is that we already mentioned and kind of glossed over that she finds out her mother committed a crime and goes home. And I actually was so impressed by how that turn is specifically handled, which is that she is fighting in the newsroom for a major story, right? She wants a juicy story. Mm -hmm. I got to love this role. Because it's basically Jennifer Jason Lee doing modern day Jennifer Jason Lee from Hutsucker Proxy. And you know yeah, how yeah. we feel about that movie. But she's doing banter. She's doing jabs. She's got business. She needs to get shit done. I bet my Pulitzer. are Right. On. And she wants to crack off a big story, right? And so that is the drama that is the initial offer of the film. And I don't know about it, but I felt very handily shepherded into thinking when a fax comes in that says there's a crazy murder. You're like, oh, this will be the juicy case. And then she gets it. And the cover letter says, isn't this your mother? And you're like, whoa, like that is such a good turn that it's not mm -hmm. about her big case. It's obviously going to be about her mother's trial. Like it, it, it's if you didn't know what it was about ahead of time, it's a very good deployment of the premise. Right. And what are faxes, if not the liminal space of the Ooh. 90s? By the way, one area where it's not, I don't think, 100% perfect is the, the accents. accents. Everyone in this, John C. Riley's comes and goes like crazy. Everyone in this is taking a big swing at that Norris accent. Yeah. It's, uh, it's straight there in particular, awesome. like, is pretty heavy into it. Yeah, goddamn and, right, Dolores. But it works because he's playing like that, like, like the lowest of the low piece of shit. And drunk so 24 hours a day, right? Yeah. Like, so he can really dip into it and be drunk and be an artifact, like an artifact of history that we all remember, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that motherfucker. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some back and forth. John C. Riley, I think is one of the ones where it's just like, it's there, but it's also not there, but I don't actually, I don't know. I never, I never lived on an Island outside of Maine. So. Well, Strathern was the other one that I'm like, that can't be how people sound, can they? That's yeah. I agree. It was those two, basically John and and Strathern. Um, mm. Also, speaking of an artifact of time, bitch, chain smokes with the windows rolled up. Don't do that, yeah. girl. <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't right. That ain't living. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but I guess if you're in Maine 90s, in winter, baby. you kind of have to if you smoke. That's I guess that's that. True. I guess if you smoke it, you're just like, I don't want to. Or you will. Window. This is what we got to talk about is all the Kingisms. Or you will, as Kathy Bates says, get all boogery. And then another Jesus. one is gory. They say gory a lot, Gory's which I don't know what that lot. means. Yeah. Good gory. Good cheese gory. and crackers. Cheese and it's crow. cold as Christmas. At least cheese and crow I've ever heard. Gory I have never, ever heard. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Jesus Crow. I do wonder though, what the fuck that is. I I guess it's just the Jesus Christ corruption, right? Jesus Crow. Yeah. 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 We figured shit out here. (laughs) Yeah. We solved it. So there's tons of those. That's a rep. There's tons of, I would say that the bullies, the adult bullies in this and even the dad, they play very simply in the manner of a Stephen King bully grown up. Like they're just grown up Stephen King's yeah, 50s greaser bullies. <laughs> kind of evil. Just, just fucking people. shithead write offs. Yeah. Like fuck these. Yeah. They're just mean for no reason. Uh, yeah. And then the other thing, because we just covered Gerald's game, I got to say, I don't actually understand so or even know if it's good or bad that Stephen King can get away with writing a book. That's critically acclaimed and sells a billion copies and gets a movie made of it. And then writing another one that all the same stuff is true of. And in both of them, a girl gives her father a hand job on the eclipse. Like that's so specific. That it's is literally specific. just redoing your own plot beat. Like just putting it back in a different thing. So that's wild to me, to me. It's one of two things. One, Stephen King is a genius and he knew that no one would give a shit. Cause clearly no, he's one clearly does. like, no one cares. It's fine. Or two, he was just drunk. <laughs> he was just drunk and he did not. He remember. forgot one or the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say it's one of the two. He's written I can't say it was indeed stories. It's hard to. Yeah. yeah he's just like, um, ah, that sounds like a good device. I should use that. Yeah, you did, buddy. Nah, did. <laughs> yeah. But I would believe, I mean, he does a lot about parents abusing their children. I don't. I think that that's more just. I mean, everyone's privacy is their privacy, right? So I don't know if that comes from a place of life, but I think publicly the thought is just, that's a really horrible, scary thing. So he uses a lot of child abuse uh, throughout and children are easy to root for, right? But I just think the details are crazy specific to the degree that I would imagine if he was drunk, it was Gerald's game. Not that Gerald's game's bad, but I can see you thinking of the simple plot elements in that drunk this is on point. And I think the symbolism being on point owes more to the book than the movie because it's literally like the facts of the case, so to speak, are really well thought through. Like we were saying in Gerald's game, the eclipse is more used as just it's ominous that it's dark. Now daddy's going to touch you in the dark. This eclipse is a liminal space and it's used to mean that that's a level of thought that's beyond the Gerald's game level of thought. (laughs) It's definitely in terms of story construction, um, more, it's more ambitious, more it's sophisticated. More, it's more woven into the plot beats and not just presented as here's some exposition of truth. It's like a reveal, you know? So yeah. there's options in the writing while we're talking about Gerald's game though. Mm-hmm. I wanted to point out a quote kind of, um, not exactly what you're talking about, but just get Gerald's game thing that we mentioned last episode when we covered it. A uh, quote from Claiborne, hell ain't something you get thrown into overnight. No, the real hell comes on you s- as slow and steady as a line of wet winter sheets. That's I, the resonant line and the way it's enshrined. You know that that's the that's the moral of the story. And it, and it hits. Of, it's very resonant. Yeah. And like Gerald's game and how we kind of talked about how, you know, um, what's God, what's her name? Jesse? I think it's Jesse. God, I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, uh, basically, there's a tinge of self disrespect. And the concept here is that horror kind of comes from an external place, absolutely. Like, you know, the monster or, you know, the man who's a drunk and about to beat you. But like Jesse, it likes Pet Cemetery, like Desperation. It's our own acts that will come back to damn us. Like we are complicit in a way by allowing these things to happen. And the even though they horror, are not our fault. The true horror of living is that you could get used to it. And yeah, and exactly. it could last for 40 years. That's what you're right. And it and then that is true and real and more chilling. It's true. Like being shot in the head is obviously less agree or in some ways less egregious than being abused for 40 years. Like what a, li- right. what a liminal space to be trapped in. I know I should leave my partner, but I can't, but I know I should, but I can't. Right. It's and an eclipse when, of sorts. When you start thinking about like the Stephen King isms of like, okay, like how does this work on an atomic level? You realize that almost all of his devices are like being stuck. 
or car failure. Dude, and shit, like the eclipse is also, you're covering up the truth. You're covering up your memory. That's so good. Right. Yeah, it's it's just, it really is one of the, it's one of the tales, and this movie does a really good job of really exposing what makes King, like, really tick. When he Not is just from, really like, the hitting, small yeah. town, outsider, pariah, sexual abuse, substance abuse, those, the, the list of themes, those things. right. Yeah, this is really like, where does his horror come from? Um, and in this movie, much like Gerald's game again, it's a focus on domestic life. Uh, we see Dolores like put out clothes. She's a housekeeper. She tidies up everything. So we take this this standpoint of normalcy for a certain type of person in the Americana like fable and then shows that their whole house is a mess. Right. And it's like, well, why is that true? Well, it's because they're stuck. It's because they don't they kind of hate themselves and the horror comes from the fact that they, they are abused, but they're also not letting themselves get free, Off the which hook is another thing, part of it. Right. Which is why it's so much better of a story than Gerald's game. In my opinion, because you get the freedom of your legacy, you get your daughter basically saying to you, like, I forgive you. And I'm sorry for not for like, for not understanding and not taking the time to understand Whereas Jesse and Gerald's game is just like, I'm going to take back my, my own, power, yeah. my power, but like, really, that's good. I'm going to bottle it up and keep my <laughs> right, trauma right, right. Or just perfectly go on with mine. my life. I yeah. also, did you see Nightmare Alley, the Del Toro? Yeah. I, I had strong resonance between those two while I was watching this in terms of the actual message that it comes down to and how it mines. I mean, that one, the obvious metaphor is a nightmare alley was a name for like a sideshow or a freak show. Um, but the character that what Bradley Cooper plays is trapped in an alley that leads directly to a nightmarish life. And the alley is made of his own actions that he freely chose to take in sequence. And he fucked himself. And even though that movie's not perfect, I love the ending when he says I was born for it. When they ask, you know, are you good for the part? And he's basically donning the mantle of I made this bed and I know I did. And now here it comes. Hell. Yeah. And it's going to yeah. be long. It's going to be a long time in hell. <laughs> right. And I think that there's a particular like blend that makes a Stephen King mo like tale for me, or yeah. at least from what the movies are coming out with is that it's very specifically not that it's entirely your fault. It's not about blame or judgment. It's about what you allow yourself to do. That is the hor true horror show. And, and I the, think the, that's the American horror show. And that you can delude yourself it. into thinking things you don't think. Meaning like it's the uh, Dolores would do anything for her daughter. It's the only thing she cares about, except admit that she had a nervous breakdown, which would be helpful for her, right? They eventually get there, but that's the obstacle they have to overcome is this it's, feeling yeah. of awkwardness when they should be combining forces and healing each other and loving each other. Right. And as someone who's like, this is a main issue of mine. If you've heard tales from the pit, like I found the movie to also be, and I think the book talking directly about how stigmatizing mental health makes you have to deal with it alone. And no one can do that. Like, the horror is you're alone. It's a, uh, uh, I hated this new movie, but the one ever, no one will save you. Right. Um, yeah. If you don't tell people what you're going through, then you can't get support. And if you feel a, that's one of the most tragic things of abuse and mental health challenges is you feel ashamed or deficient. You don't want people to know that you've been broken in some way. And you feel like if you let them know, things will only get worse when the opposite is true. The only way things will ever get better is if you pull in supports from your, you know, in your life. Um, and I love, like, I love send you a sacrifice. I love anything. That's just about like how, you can't get free until you guys sit down and drink whiskey. I'm an AA, so I wouldn't say that part, but like they had to have that conversation have talk, and they yeah. center the conversation of like, we have to have like so many plays used to like Pinter plays. It's like, well, this is it. We have to have the conversation that the family has been trying to avoid having for 20 years or we cannot move past this. So mm -hmm. let's fucking dig in and like do it. And in typical King fashion, who has often talked about his, He's gone back and forth in his career or just in his age about faith, but now he's, he's openly faithful. He, does, he chooses not to write about it to say st secular and kind of keep his stories fairly universal, but you do yeah. see them. Um, it very much is a part of him, like the American you know, setup. It's the mythos of America to be like, well, if it's a Christian nation, so to speak, 
forgiveness is freedom. Um, so that's almost always where if there's a happy ending in a Stephen King story, it's because someone forgave someone or themselves. That's just hundred percent, I think. Yeah. And yet it's not board. content with just presenting that as a really pat, like preachy moral fable. For example, at the end, Selena has a moment where she hesitates and could admit and start the whole chain of whatever legal proceedings there would be that she now understands that her father was murdered, but it was self-defense. Should we get into that publicly? And she lies. She mm -hmm. helps her mother heal and protects her by lying. Whereas up to this point, every lie has been bad and every truth has been good. Some at the end, at a crucial moment, one lie is good. Uh, and I love movies that are like, it's not one size fits all though. You got to keep your head on a swivel. That's what life is mm -hmm. like. You have to make a series of fraught choices, right? A lie is generally bad and a truth is generally good, but not always. You got to use your best judgment with this shit. Right. And in the execution of the movie, they do this very intentionally. Um, the same thing happened, like we were talking about color earlier and they use two different film stocks. They use like Kodak and Fuji because of the color representation on the film. That's an old archaic right, thing. Right, the flashbacks no are way more saturated than the present. The lie is bright and colorful. The present and the truth is drab and blue. But it's real. Um, right, it's, it has but the But it's real and it's true. the confrontation they need to make. The past is the past is a series Rosy of details colored. that got us here, got us to the job yeah. in blue, and only the truth will set us free. And That's from that. the craftsmanship point of view, got to point out, um, especially in 95, what were some very ambitious technical ideas. For example, a shot that sweeps around the back of Dolores's head while she's drifting off into a flashback and it wipes from uh, from drab to colorful as her head passes by camera yeah, that was nice. harder to do at that time than that's so easy to do now but um mm -hmm. and very consistent stuff like that there's diopter shots where the foreground is drab and the background is like it's it's as if you had a creature effect and you didn't just content yourself with the same shot of the creature over and over. They skinned the flashback game a lot of different ways. You can tell that Taylor Hackford is ambitious and interested in doing interesting things. Yeah, he, he wants to have a visual strategy and kind of deploy it in a way that matters for the story um, at the right point. And we just and like I think that. he does that. <laughs> we like That's that. That's the gravy. That's when a movie goes into like gravy territory for me. Like, oh, yeah. you didn't even have to try that hard. I wish all movies did though, but good on you. We get big hard ons for craft. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing this for Papa Bear right now, mm -hmm. our movie mm -hmm. that we're making. Mm -hmm. And our conversations Ugh. are a lot of fun. Dude, we got to go like, yeah, that's a great shot. We oh, really need to take so out the scene where uh, someone gives Papa Bear a hand job during an eclipse, though, just that's because I think it's well trod at this scene, point. Yeah. Michael. <laughs> yeah. At least no, this one has, both adults. <laughs> this, this one has a ton of split diopter and color choices. You know me. I love split diopter. <laughs> Uh, but I love how they, yeah, they use the split diopter as like past and present. And that's like pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Like you were um, saying when I, I was busting your balls about how you famously don't like split diopter and you said, but, mm -hmm. but every tool can be used as a tool. I really like that. Yeah. A doctor movies like <laughs> right, yeah. a split diopter is something it's two planes that are in focus simultaneously. Therefore you could make it mean something. And so they do. Right. Like and so they do. They yeah. don't pull the tool out for no reason. It means that, Oh, you, the audience have to hold both these plot lines in mind and both need to be in focus simultaneously. Please please feel invited to put that effort right, in. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I like if people have listened on Monday night movie nights or anything like that, and I've made that split diopter comment because I think it's funny. I think it's funny to not like it. I think it's an awkward tool, but never be angry at tools for being tools. Like, <laughs> you, are you angry at a screwdriver for like, if it does the thing you, you fucking, it's winning the game. Even so, guns. Like, it really Even is the guns. fault of humans. Functional. It really is, yeah. Functional. It's always hu human error. That's right. Pilot uh, error. But yeah, so there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good stuff like that. Um, what else we want to talk well, about? Well, I here? wanted to say that uh, since you brought up our father son movie, and this is a mother daughter movie, love talking. We about of our, course yeah. have resonant lines at the end when they make up. 
And I thought the resonant lines at the end when they make up here, pretty solid because I like really simple, straightforward, unadorned lines that still mean a lot on a primal level. Um, Mm -hmm. The lines are, I don't know how to feel, but what you did, but now I know you did it for me. Um, Both of those things are true. Nothing extra is true. It's not wordy. (laughs) It's like Hemingway-esque. She is just saying, I was this way and now I'm this way. And that is the heart of the story. And boom, and we're done here, right? And then the mom says, well, her version of that, which is, uh, the daughter says, I don't want to lose you again. And she goes, ah, go, you can't lose me. And that's everything about her that, that is important for us to know about her. Right. That's, that's the, uh, that's my, now that I know you're good, I'm good. And that's parenthood to me. Right. And that's beautiful. This movie is full of turns of phrases, phrases like Like people are very witty. Um, one of my favorite ones that I wrote down was early days when Jennifer Jason Lee is basically like, I don't want to be here. And like, I just arrived and uh, Dolores is trying to connect with her and saying like, are you with someone like, uh, and she's like, no, I'm not with it. Like, she's like, I'm not going to basically tell that. And she's like, you're telling me there's nobody. And Jennifer Jason Lee's response is I'm telling you, there's a whole lot of nobodies. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, that is clever. That is also very indicative of exactly what, like how participant Jennifer Jason Lee wants to be with her mother and also what her life is like. It's three things. And she repeatedly time. seems to be rub. Yeah. She's a career woman with no time for anything else. She wants her mom to feel bad because she thinks her mom's a bitch. <laughs> like that's and part isolated. Of it. Yeah. She wants to isolate her mom and to make it like, you're not a part of my life. Yeah, make, don't get that in your yeah, head. Please don't get it twisted. I'm not here to make up, which of course is the way that you have to start your arc. If the end is, well, wouldn't you know it? We made up. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. It's perfect. Yeah. It's how Duh. the math it's works the, out. Um, it's and good. dude, and the offers, which I'm, sh- which I know must be the same in the book because they're so specific. Oh, talk about family and domesticity. That that the girl, little girl, tried to kill herself by slitting her throat with a crushed yep, Christmas one. ornament. Crushed. It's Christmas. and we get a shot of the ornament right before that her reflection is warped in. So it's like she's looking at herself. She can't see herself in the right way. She feels warped and broken. I'm going to crush our family and kill myself with it. It all works. (laughs) It all, it works, man. It all works And I love that there's that line also that it's as cold as Christmas. Um, (laughs) Uh, It's just one of those. uh, I'm getting all muzzy here trying to think of what to say to you. (laughs) <laughs> oh, also, of course, the one I wrote down, the guy on the phone. Did you help kill your mom, bitch? Did you help your fat bitch mom kill your dad? Ha 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 ha. I thought that was very witty. That was very <laughs> that's, that's, that's just me. I love, I, I love <laughs> Stephen King's Dude, bullies Dude, these people, so much. it's like, don't you have other shit to do? They just hate Dolores Claiborne. It's I, like their full hobby. The scene where they, clearly it's a group of men that got drunk in town, <laughs> drove out to the outskirts of town to visit Dolores' house and just yell at her from afar. Let's bar. take our truck out there and yell at that lady. She <laughs> killed your husband. She killed Joe. Okay. Yeah. No, I didn't. And I know who you are. Best part, she knows, she knows, she knows them all by name. She knows it's an island. She's like, I know which four drunk guys you are. <laughs> You're not sneaky. Yeah. I know. I can see your car. And they're like, well, we, we won't be back. You know, it's like, yeah. I just love the small townness of it all. That's also very right. king, right? It's always kids on bikes, no fax machine, yeah. blue collar backdrop. Yeah. The only time uh, it really rubbed me wrong, which is a minor offense, was when like these things we're discussing were almost too on the nose for me or too obvious, which happens once or twice. Like at the end, oh, yeah. there's a shot. They talk a lot about hands and then the daughter takes the mother's hand, you know, and you're like, okay, it's fine to do that. But obviously we've seen it a lot. Or the fact that Joe, that we crossfade from the hole in the well to the eclipse. I'm like, okay, circle, circle. Didn't, didn't need that, but okay. It's, it's forgivable. It's forgivable. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. That's why I don't like it. It's not as meaningful as any of the other maneuvers. I mean, I'm sure I could find a reason. I'm sure I could art school explain it in a way, but it's not immediately jumping out at me. And therefore I feel it doesn't work well. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not, it doesn't feel like it's of the DNA. I think it's more of the thing that we settled on, which is this kind of this moment of truth or this moment of seeing things from a new perspective, a mental liminal space, a a breakthrough of some kind. Um, And just the fact that uh, 
the sequence of things that had to go wrong for that mailman to come in and see her in that exact position really reminded so me of the French waiter in the Simpsons who gets the chowder order wrong and like yeah. beats himself up with a bunch of hanging pans. <laughs> Cause like, yeah, it's just so perfect. Um, Oh dude. Okay. I think I'm done. But the other, uh, uh, technique I was like, I have to mention this before we get out is, uh, that, this movie scrupulously doesn't break the 180 because it's trying to be fairly transparent, and that's how you do that. It's disconcerting mm. to break the 180. But standard coverage. In the in very words. moment that Dolores Claiborne raises an axe, considering killing her husband for the first time, we cut to a shot behind her that breaks the 180 that is intentionally really jarring. It's the perfect use of it. Nice. And then in that, I didn't even notice that. In that same setup, when she tells her daughter, go to bed now, we're just talking, the daughter turns off a light that makes Dolores have a perfectly square black backdrop behind her and the axe. It's just such a cool mm. set of shots. Yeah, there's some visual like stuff mm, going candy. on, even though it is a very sneaky like, or it's just typical drama. When you watch most of the shots, you're like, "Yeah, this is I've most seen of this, this a thousand is, times before." Right at its Which worst, it will have moments where you're like, "This could almost be a harm, Hallmark special movie," and I don't like that about it. Um, but ultimately, I really think it stands. It really does. It stand. looks like a '95 movie because of the f- grain of the film, which isn't a thing, but. I still like it. I like it. Hey, Michael, Mm -hmm. it stands. (gasps) In the place where you live. Yeah. The stand. The stand. Time to make your stand. This is where we annoy ourselves by reading a long list. Uh, or we don't. Or we don't. Oh, guess what? I can just Last go. episode, we said we were going to talk about it before. We're like, every episode, we'll talk about it before, about how we cover it, how we cover this section, because it's now 27 entries long, and I don't want to list 27 things. Right. We didn't do that. Nah, uh, because nah, we, nah, <laughs> nah, we forgot. Nah. And this is our job. Right. Uh-oh. Um, do you want to do, like... I think we should path? go from the top until we hit Dolores Claiborne, and then stop. <laughs> how about that? Okay. Yeah. All right. Because the real exciting thing would be if it was number one, Dolores Claiborne, right? Number yeah. one, Michael Jackson's ghost. That's right. I stole his bit. <laughs> Michael Jackson's ghost. He stole my bit. <laughs> no, my, it's the shining. It's still the shining. It's still the shining. So far, so good. Me. Number two, Dr. Sleep for me. Uh, stand by me, dude. Stand by me. I, it's the sequel to The Shining. I went onesie twosie with The Shining. It's still I a like good movie. the lore of The Shining. I won't lie. Um, number three for me is Stand by Me. Solid movie. Uh, number three for me is the other Kathy Kathy Bates vehicle, the first Misery. You almost said, which is my number four, the Kathy Lee Gifford vehicle. No, um, <laughs> uh, Misery. Mine's also Misery. Uh, <laughs> number man, sorry, I'm just imagining Kathy Lee and Regis Lee. Uh, in misery. <laughs> you broke my ankles. This is outrageous. <laughs> uh, what are we on? I can number even five. Remember. Four, number five, four. Well, I didn't say Doctor Sleep, which oh, is my okay. Number four, 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 four. Sorry, I was going first. Number five is the mist for me. The, the Darabon mist. mist. We agree, and we've kind of done all the things. We yeah, with top five. And I got to tell you. Straight to the top of the rest for me comes Dolores Claiborne at number six. For Abe, number six is Dolores Claiborne. Oh, another matchy. Oh, we love it when our peens touch and are the our same. Our peens touch. And <laughs> this one was tough because right under that one for both of us is Carrie. Yes. No, Gerald's game for me, then Carrie. Then Carrie. Okay. But both of those, I, I think this outplays Ger- Gerald's game. And because of the. Like it's doing a different thing, but because it's doing like the same kind of story, just in a yeah. like better, I think it kind of just, it just falls, uh, it falls to the, the top, but Carrie, that was tough because Carrie is a con. That's the know? one where I shoot it on Carrie on my wayward son. I'm such a fucking idiot. Um, such a fucking idiot. <laughs> I also think, I just want to say for those out there, if they think it is a travesty, if adjusted for inflation, so to speak, I think Carrie Uh, would beat Gerald's game. Uh, I just thought Carrie, the first half, feels really boring now because it's like a late 70s movie. You're like, all right, get to the murders. And like with Running Man and other entries on the list, I clearly put higher stock into just like 
oh, but it's got the cool thing, like the blood on the face, and we all remember it. You can like go for Zeitgeist. a single set piece, like raises it a, a notch. Yeah, yeah, raises it a notch for me. So I, that's why it was tough for me. But Dolores Claiborne, a movie Good. that better than I expected. We for both sure. had not seen before this episode. Making it to um, the top ten. Making it to the top. It, I we we are sleeping. We're sleeping on Dolores, on Dolores. Claiborne, and it pushes uh, pushes creep. Sh- no, pushes Cujo out of my top ten. Sorry, Cuj. It pushes fourteen oh eight out of my top ten. That sucks because fourteen oh eight go hard, as I say yeah, every I time. Know. I know, I know. I just want to see John Cusack have a bad time, man. It's all I want. We know what next episode is. Do you want to drop? <gasps> oh that? God. Okay. Sure. Well, I think we should explain the whole enchilada. So, um, this yeah. has been. The penultimate episode of Kings of Kings season two. That means we're doing 14 episodes a season. If you're counting, Uh, we're up to by the time we complete this season, next episode, we'll have 28. And that about matches how many episodes of Anders Sons we have per season. So it's that time again. And I know some of you are really happy about that. Some of you are really sad about that. That is how life goes. Um, So now we'll be doing Anders Sons for about 14 episodes. It will probably be the final uh, full season yeah, of I don't Anderson's. even think we have 14, right. but I think we have like 11 or something. Because but those we'll filmmakers can only make so many films and they're both winding up. They're in the winding mm-hmm. up phase of their careers. Um, so I do think like with Coen Brothers Brothers, like if another P.T. Anderson comes out down the line, we'll do a special episode we'll and it. hit it up. Just like we did it was Tragedy and Macbeth. Exactly. Even that wasn't a joint Coen Brothers. Yes. So you just know that we we need we but, need to precious. Uh, we are... And we'll get back to Kings of King. King, there's still plenty of us. There will be more. Uh, mm. But next episode, the final episode of season two, is one I think you've all been waiting for. It's about a prison. Okay, bye. <laughs> and that's it. Green Mile. Green Mile is the episode. Green Mile. <laughs> We're doing it again. <laughs> <laughs>